Hello, uh, I'm Vagrant Cascadian. I will be talking about reproducible tool chains for the win. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, a lot of these talks are well over my head, but uh, hopefully uh, I can uh, entice you into helping. Uh, so a bit about myself. Uh, I've uh, been a Debian user for since 2001. Uh, Somewhere halfway between then and now, I became a Debian developer, and I got involved in reproducible builds just a few years ago, uh, mostly by hosting a small uh, build zoo full of little arm boards. And we've been rebuilding all of Debian for years. Um, and so uh, I also want to know, like, who am I talking to? Like, so what I'm hoping, and, and I've got a few questions for you, you know, raise a hands kind of thing. Um, who in here has submitted a patch to like a major tool chain? And I like this audience. Uh, who here is currently a maintainer of some tool chain type thing? Okay, I, I really like this audience. Great. I, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> um, I figured given the nature of the conference, this audience would be uh, uh, like that. And uh, I'm glad to see you all showed up. So um, when I'm talking about reproducible builds, I'm not just talking about a build where you like build the source code and it doesn't fail to build. Uh, I'm actually talking about bit by bit reproducibility. So when you give the same source code, the same uh, tool chain, uh, you get a bit for bit identical output. Uh, and um, so uh, it's not just that you can reproduce the build environment and it's got the same versions of stuff installed. It, we're, we're looking for something a little bit more of a higher bar here. Um, historically, uh, software was reproducible. Uh, in, in the way old days, you knew exactly what every single bit was. <laughs> uh, things have gotten more complicated over time, and uh, that's no longer the case. But uh, somewhere, I, I've even heard stories uh, in the early 80s, uh, a lot of the GNU tool chain, there was effort to actually make the, the tool chain itself reproducible and its outputs. Uh, but then time passed, weird things happen, and that's not the way it is today. Which is a shame, but we're working on fixing it again. So what matter, wh why does reproducible builds matter? Um, well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, there are, uh, one thing that it is really useful for is you can detect uh, backdoors in your build environments or if you're building software on a developer machine. Uh, you can just look for weird things. If normally the build result doesn't come out identical, then it doesn't set up any red flags. So this, this allows us to do some things uh, that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Uh, it also optimizes for like build caches, uh, like C cache and things like that. Uh, the more reproducible things are, the more, uh, the, the faster rebuild times you can have. Uh, and also, since this is a GNU event, uh, license compliance verification actually becomes a lot easier with reproducible builds. And I'll be getting into that in a bit. And personally, it just feels wrong when you build something and you build it again and it comes out different and you didn't change anything. Um, so uh, to me, it's kind of just like a, a moral imperative <laughs> that stuff builds the same. Um, so uh, one of the ways, uh, what it won't do for you though, uh, it's not going to detect flaws in your source code. So uh, it, it's all about what you feed into it is uh, one of the inputs and what you get out of it should be the output. It's not going, if you have broken things in your input, you're not going to detect that the outputs are broken. But um, so with GPL compliance, uh, I, I think this audience gets that source code is what you use to write free software. Binary code is what's actually used. How can you prove that the binaries used are the actual results of the source code, or at least the intended result? Uh, reproducible builds gives you a way to maybe not prove, but gain greater confidence that you're actually producing the right result. 
Uh, another big thing I see a lot in um, in uh, talking to some of the Free Software Foundation folks is they're trying to do this Respects Your Freedom campaign. And one of the biggest problems they have with kind of getting verification for hardware is uh, they can't verify that the software on it is actually free. Um, sometimes it won't even build, but even if it does build, they can't know that it's the same so uh, software that's installed on this hardware. And that's been a big challenge for uh, some of the Respect Your Freedom campaigns. Um, and then there's all sorts of other random software on the Respect Your Freedom hardware. So that's kind of like a license compliance thing, but also just an enabling you know, campaigns like Respect Your Freedom. Um, well, one of the biggest problems with reproducibility is time. <laughs> um, so, for whatever reason, over time, people really have uh, gotten in this habit of just embedding the timestamps in all sorts of intentional and un unintentional ways in their build results. Um, ideally, you wouldn't include timestamps of any kind from a reproducible builds perspective. You wouldn't include timestamps in your builds. Um, uh, so we came up with this thing called source state epoch, uh, which is a specification that uh, you basically specify the last modification time of ideally like the sources, like maybe the last uh, commit hash or, or the com commit version or uh, a date that has more meaning than when you build it. Because if you build software today and you don't change anything in the build environment other than that the clock's ticking and you build it 10 years from now, I still think you should get a reproducible build. Um, so we find that uh, the source state epoch specification was really useful in defining a meaningful time sort of thing that you then can embed into your binaries. And the last modification of the sources seems like a much more meaningful result to embed there, at least to us. And a lot of upstreams have uh, started adopting this spec. So it basically just, um, for example, GCC, added support for source date epoch, where you basically specify the source date epoch environment variable, and then uh, any of the dates that would have gotten replaced with the current time uh, get replaced with that value. And so obviously, you build something with GCC, and then you build it again, you get embedded the same dates. Um, GZIP also has a feature that you can remove uh, it it's the no-name argument, aka dash n, uh, but it also conveniently also removes the timestamp. So if you have uh, in the results of any of your artifacts that you're building, if you're using gzip, uh, and there was also a patch, I'm not, I think it maybe even got accepted to uh, not store the timestamp when compressing on standard input. So gzip, uh, they've joined the no time party. Um, Another big issue is build paths, and we tried to define a, uh, a specification called the, the build, prefix map, build path prefix map, uh, and this is something so that uh, if, you build, uh, if you build the software, uh, there are all sorts of ways in which the files get embedded into the binary results. And so if I'm building it in home Bob, and you're building it in you know, home Alice, uh, you, you shouldn't get a different build result. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the full paths get embedded, um, but we, uh, we, we, we tried to specify the build path prefix map to uh, make all of the paths relative to the source. Um, so that way uh, you can still get a different reproducible output depending on uh, which, uh, depend independent of where you built it in. Um, so, uh, one of the things that GCC has done uh, uh, a number of years back is there was the DPUG prefix map specification, and this uh, allowed removing essentially the full paths to the debugging symbols and to make it a relative path, because realistically uh, you may not have access to the original paths. Oh, oh dear. You may not have access to the original paths in your debug symbols. Um, so 
realistically, that's, it's not meaningful data to embed in there. So really, you just need a way to find uh, the debug information, and GCC has a command line for that. Um, but we also see a lot of things in, um, ah, yes, and in uh, Debian, dpackage by default will uh, enable that flag for GCC as of uh, 2016 in an earlier version of dpackage. But very recently, there was a new, uh, re relatively recently, I think it made it into GCC 8, uh, there was the macro prefix map and the file prefix map, which this kind of does almost exactly what we always wanted for reproducible builds, which allows you a way to specify uh, when you have a, a path that you're building with, and it starts with this string, replace it with this other string, which could even be like dot slash, and suddenly you've got these uh, relative paths, which is awesome. Uh, we're pretty happy about that, but, um, so in, uh, I mostly work with Debian, um, and we have uh, the GCC captures build path issue. Unfortunately, uh, while when you pass file prefix map into the binary, it only solved uh, roughly a third of the issues, and that's because some binaries still end up embedding the uh, they embed the flags used that GCC was called with into the binary. And so you've moved the problem from one place into another. So, um, and that's not necessarily GCC itself, but some tool chains, I know QT tool chains in particular do this, um, and uh, possibly CMake in general. So we still ended up with a roughly 1,000 packages in Debian unreproducible because of this. Um, so uh, earlier, um, Shimon Lo, uh, tried to propose getting the, uh, the full build path specification in using an environment variable. Um, because command line arguments, they sometimes get embedded into the build results. And so it was unfortunately rejected on the premise of taking data from the environment variable, which was a little bit perplexing because we had just had all this great success getting the source date epoch environment variable in, and they said, well, if we would have noticed, we would have rejected that too. But anyway, uh, so some ideas about how to work around that. Um, possibly maybe a new, uh, a new command line flag which wouldn't actually show the data that you're trying to embed. Uh, I, I just kind of came up with file prefix map from M. Uh, and then you specify the variable to pull it from. So it's very explicit but you, don't, you still don't have the, the actual prefix map. And the other thing we're basically doing a lot of in Debian is just working around this issue by building in the same directory. So on our, on our test infrastructure, re, we're rebuilding in a predictable path uh, for, for our testing release and for our unstable in, in workflow branch, we're still doing build path variations. So this is kind of like the middle road. It's a simple workaround. And we've kind of backburnered the, the build path issue to some degree, um, just because there is such a simple workaround and uh, we'd like to focus on other things. But we would love if uh, we can get some uh, uh, other ideas on how to actually get a more complete support for the build path prefix map into GCC. And I'm here asking for your help for that. Um, there was also a recent patch, uh, LTO optimizations uh, uh, introduced some indeterminism, and I think maybe that got merged. I'm not positive. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that particular issue. Um, GNU make uh, wildcard globs in your make files. Uh, they should be sorted, and I, I, I seem to recall this one kind of went back and forth. It got accepted, and then it got reverted, and then it got accepted again, and I'm not exactly sure the, the current state. Um, but, uh, so, uh, but if you have a make file and you have a glob uh, in there to specify you know, all your splat C files or whatever, um, the order that those come out in, if you want it to be reproducible, uh, it, can, it can change the order of the results. So. Um, and then, yeah, ah, this was the, uh, I guess this, this patch actually landed, so, uh, but I don't know if it got reverted again. <laughs> I hope not. 
Um, so there are so many different things that can kind of go into a build. Uh, you know, volatile inputs, uh, value initialization, locales can affect the builds. Uh, one of my, one of the projects I work on is U-Boot, and in Debian, I was noticing like, why are our builds on U-Boot reproducible unless the locale is Italian? It doesn't matter if it's Korean, Arabic locale, or you know, other Western European, but Italian. Like, why Italian? <laughs> like, out of all the things that would be re irreproducible. And it turns out, uh, for some reason, uh, the translators for uh, GNU LD uh, decided to translate a string that nobody else bothered to translate, and the output of GNU LD was LD de GNU. And so the, the string just ended up being, uh, that was the only translation of that string, and uh, well, it made some irreproducible results. Simple workaround, you build in the C locale. Uh, archive metadata like tar and uh, zip and all sorts of things. They embed all sorts of timestamp information, usernames, that sort of thing. Uh, the stable order for your outputs, you know, if you're doing a highly parallelizable build, uh, you know, maybe this file gets written before that one and it's all the same exact files, but if they're put into your build in a different order, that can sometimes cause some issues. Uh, just general randomness. Um, I know Python ha and, and possibly Perl have an environment variable where you can uh, define the, the hash seed. So you can kind of predefine, okay, we're going to use this thing for our, our, our initializing our pseudo random number generator. Um, ah, quite possibly. <laughs> Excellent. Um, build paths uh, kind of went over that at length. Um, and uh, we also worked at like generating system images, uh, like operating system images, uh, live CD images, uh, that sort of thing. And time, and time zones. <laughs> and time, and time again. We really want to get rid of time. <laughs> um, so, so all that's great. This is kind of about some of the ways you can make the tool chains make uh, um, you can incorporate uh, ideas and features into the actual tool chain itself. Um, but also, the tool chain itself, it's kind of important for it to be reproducible. So um, right now, in our, our test suite for Debian Unstable, uh, there are six kind of key unreproducible packages. Uh, Bash, Perl, or Bash, Linux, Perl, uh, and uh, binutils, GCC. Quite a few GNU tools in there. Um, so, uh, you know, just saying. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we have a few that failed to build. glibc, oh, I don't know why exactly that failed to build. These, these results were like hot off the presses earlier this morning. Um, but in our testing suite, it's a much prettier picture. The, uh, and based the, one of the main differences between our testing suite and our unstable suite is we vary build paths. And here, the only uh, unreproducible one was GCC itself. So that's looking a lot better. Um, and I would love to see GCC reproducible. Um, XZUtils is another one. I don't know if anybody knows much about that. And then most of them, uh, the vast majority of them, are actually reproducible once we, once we make uh, the, the build path stable. Um, but, so uh, in unstable also, when you're thinking about the build itself, you also have to think about all of its build dependencies. And here, we're looking at a much larger package set. We went from like 50-some packages to 3,000-some. Uh, and here, uh, you know, roughly 10% of the, the, the whole set uh, needed in order to build the essential set that's used to build packages on Debian uh, are unreproducible. That's 300 some packages. Um, so, and then a handful that failed to build, um, but still the, the vast majority are still reproducible. So it's not an, a bleak picture. And of course, once you remove build path variations, that looks even better. Um, but, uh, so, so I would really love to see the actual tool chains themselves be reproducible. And why is that kicking in? 
Um, let's see. And another project uh, that's kind of like our, our sister project to reproducible builds is the bootstrappable project. Um, so what compiler do you use to compile your compiler? Uh, it, it, it's a classic bootstrapping problem. Uh, they've often talked about it in terms of like yogurt. Like in order to make yogurt, you add yogurt to milk. Uh, and this is, a, um, this is a kind of fundamental issue because it gets back to the trusting trust problem. Uh, so, I mean, this is a problem that it was mentioned in the early 80s based on work that maybe even went a decade or more earlier than that. Uh, and it's kind of a fundamental problem for all of computing, really. Uh, so one of the main solutions to solving trusting trust is diverse double compilation. Uh, and so David A. Wheeler did some work uh, to prove that it was actually possible. Uh, and, but one of the first steps in order to get diverse double compilation to work is you need reproducibility. Uh, because basically what you end up doing is you take a very simple compiler and, and another compiler that's like implemented in an entirely different language and you try to build the same thing and get a reproducible result and then you bootstrap a very minimal compiler that ideally you, you build it on you know, innumerable other differently implemented compilers to build the exact same thing and then you can have pretty good confidence that that doesn't have a trusting trust problem. Ideally, maybe you even build it in a language that was just invented a couple of years ago to bootstrap this new compiler. Um, and believe it or not, people are working on this. Um, uh, the GNU MESS project has been working on, uh, they basically got a self-hosting scheme interpreter that can be used to build a very minimal C compiler, and that C compiler can be used to build GNU MESS, and they're basically working on, uh, on bootstrapping a compiler, and I believe GNU Geeks uh, soon will be using that uh, to reduce the, the amount of just random blob binaries they use to bootstrap their distribution. And uh, um, so, we're actually looking in the not so distant future at possibly seeing a distribution of software that has solved the trusting trust problem, maybe? That's pretty exciting to me. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the tools we've developed for, uh, we've developed some tools to help you uh, look at the differences between binary. Uh, but if you build something, you build it again, and you get these binary things. If you do a diff on a binary, I, I, you know, there's only so much you can get out of that. So what Diffoscope does is it it's, uh, intent, it's, has a numer numerous modules that will uh, look at what, what is it I'm comparing against what, and then intelligently like unpack that into another format. Say you've got like uh, uh, an ISO uh, CD image archive, which on it is a tarball, and inside of that tarball you have a PDF, and it, it just goes through and recursively unpacks all of those things. And it will attempt to render that in a way that's, uh, that's hum human readable to some degree. Uh, so it's basically, uh, sometimes I've referred to it as diff on steroids. Um, and it's useful for diagnosing like what exactly was unreproducible about this thing, but not exactly why. Well, it's used for analyzing why, not whether it is or not, because to determine whether it is or not, you just do a checksum, you know, a simple secure cryptographic checksum. Um, it's available on numerous distributions, and uh, it supports a few file formats. <laughs> Um, and uh, that list is growing. It's pretty. It's written in Python, and it has pretty simple module infrastructure where you can add a module. And we've made sure that tests have to come with any new additions. So uh, uh, it's reasonably good at uh, producing results that uh, work over time. And there's even a web interface for it, so uh, you can just like. Pop in, a, pop in a web browser, feed it two files, and get uh, uh, some diff out, output. 
because it supports so many file formats, it has a huge tree of dependencies in order to get the maximal amount of support. So uh, there's this web service which has everything installed so that you don't have to install gigabytes worth of tools in order to do some diffscope. ReproTest itself uh, uh, is a tool that helps to build something and it even has a feature It'll build something, it'll change some things that shouldn't affect the build input, but we've observed sometimes do, and then, uh, and then run Diffiscope on it to give you the result of like, why was it different? Or, oh, that, that worked out to be the same. And I think it even has a feature where you can, it'll run it and then it'll iterate through the different types of variations systematically to try and identify exactly where things went wrong. So, It'll go through and one time it'll vary the locale, another time it'll vary the build path, another time it'll vary the timestamp, uh, those kinds of things. So it'll systematically go through and help you identify like what kinds of issues should you be looking for. And uh, yeah, ah, there we are. And so uh, we do need some help with ReproTest. It's kind of lacking maintainership right now. So. Uh, Anybody who's interested in diving in or a, a Google Summer of Code student or something like that, um, we're definitely looking for help with uh, getting ReproTest up to speed. In, in particular, I don't think it, it currently makes some assumptions that make it a little bit hard to port to a distribution other than Debian. Not huge, but nobody's bothered to do the work yet. So um, if anybody is a, you know, a maintainer of some distribution other than Debian that would like to see this tool in Debian, uh, we would love your help. And uh, speaking of help, uh, we have a contribute page. There's a mailing list, IRC, some friendly people on there. Uh, we, we're currently doing most of our code hosting on uh, salsa.debian.org. Um, it's the project has kind of, uh, th this latest iteration of reproducible builds kind of had a major kickstart in Debian, but we do have a lot of contributors from other projects. But that's where our uh, hosting infrastructure is. And we have a test infrastructure. If you go to test.reproduciblebuilds.org, you can see all, all, all sorts of pretty graphs and things. And uh, if you maintain a package, see if it's reproducible in Debian or not. Uh, and. Uh, that's pretty much it. So I was hoping to have a, a nice long question and answer session, maybe even merging into like a boff-like kind of thing. Um, so uh, please uh, ask away, dive in. I mean, one of the problems is, is the compiler is not enough. You have to also do the operating system, all the include files, all the libraries to make sure that you have exactly the right library because you know bugs happen and all that kind of stuff. I've even run into cases where the new version of the machine implements instructions differently and stack um, you know things that were invalid code in the thing, but it still shows up in, in terms of the differences. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we're working on systematically trying to root out those kinds of problems uh, over time. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? I've got a question about reproducibility at the level of a whole distribution. So, do I understand correctly that what we'd like to get to eventually say is that if you take the source code of some release of Debian and then you do the double diverse compilation, you should be able to bootstrap it and in the end it will converge to exactly the set of binaries that you had in that release? That's my goal. Uh, one of my fantasies is to actually do an extremely inefficient rsync where we, we create a complete mirror of Debian that was done by recompiling everything. Uh, do I understand correctly that right now, however, for example, say you switch the version of GCC and Debian from 9.1 to 9.2 or whatever, you don't then automatically replace all the binaries that were built with 9.1 with ones built with 9.2 if that generates different code? That's definitely true of Debian. Um, I know GNU Geeks or NixOS tends to actually do the recompilation. When, when, you, change, when you change a part of the tool chain, you ne necessarily have to rebuild the, the entire downstream of that of that change. Um, Debian doesn't do that per se. Um, most of our testing right now, I, our, our best numbers look like 94%. 
It's a bit of a last mile problem, though, because we've solved all the easy issues. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, oh, what was I going to say? I had one more point on what you were saying. Um, yeah, uh, basically, um, ah, just go on. <laughs> so do you plan then to move to rebuilding things when they build dependencies change in order to get to the point where the source code of that version of the distribution is enough to reproduce that version of the distribution it, right. bit for bit across every package in it? That's a nice long-term goal. Debian does move slowly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's as somebody both involved in Debian and reproducible builds, I definitely want to move towards that. We also noticed like there are some packages in Debian that haven't been rebuilt in like five or more years. And so uh, we, we, we do have some plans of rebuilding some packages, uh, probably not to the point where we'll rebuild everything on every minor version bump. But, but we're, we're, we're looking at that kind of issue for sure. Well, of course, it only really matters if rebuilding actually changes things. If the package you build now is indeed bit for bit identical to the one built five years ago, that's fine. Sure, exactly. Which probably won't be the case if it contains C code, but right. it could quite possibly be the case for a package that only contains scripts or whatever. Sure, exactly. Um, and the easiest way to find out is to try it. <laughs> so yeah, anyone else? Um, this, um, this situation you have when you propose to move like command line options to, to environment variables, and you mentioned that it has been rejected mm -hmm. in some projects. Um, what is the value for me uh, to have a reproducible build if I don't have a reproducible built environment? Right. I mean, it's not that like moving the dirt under the carpet a bit, like uh, right. Um, so so what we do do is um, uh, let's see if I can get this. Uh, what we do do is we specify um, an actual build environment with. Uh, let's see here. Oops. Uh, we do actually have something that we use to specify the build environment. Oops, wrong domain. But are you proposing for the projects to actually distribute that description of the build environment? Exactly. Ah, okay. Um, so basically, oh, we have networking. We have some networking. Anyway, it basically will define, like, these are the environment variables used. This was this. This was the tool chain used, ideally with hashes. Though uh, where Debian's at right now, it's just version numbers. Um, but but yes, you will specify all of that kind of information and and distribute it separately. And then ideally, we have third parties that go and attempt to rebuild it. And that's one of the big things we're working on right, uh, this year and uh, probably into the next year is getting third parties doing the rebuilding and seeing yes, I could rebuild that or no, I couldn't. Uh, uh, that, that sort of thing, um, because that's really the, the most important thing about reproducible builds uh, is that, uh, oh yeah. But how can I know that the build environment corresponds to that build? So what, what, uh, what built, uh, and it's not showing up because it's on the one screen. Um, <clears throat> so basically we will, Ah, sure, if you want to get this working. <laughs> um, so basically, what we, we will publish the results of the what we call them build info files. Uh, like Arch Linux actually embeds them into the actual distributed packages, which has a bit of a, a problem because then you need to extract them out again in order to verify the reproducibility. Um, uh, Not working. OK. Um, yeah, I would like to show you a picture <laughs> of what it looks like. Uh, but basically, we distribute that um, possibly through another channel. And then people can look at the, the, the build info and use the build info to actually reproduce the build environment. And we're not, 
it's the kind of thing where we're not expecting if you, I mean, possibly a minor change in one of the, the build dependencies uh, might result in a reproducible result, but we are expecting you should have the exact same versions of all of the tool chains involved uh, in order to actually reproduce. Uh, long term, in order to really get into diverse double compilation, you need to be able to reproduce like at least like a, a key seed uh, compiler of some form uh, with diverse things. But uh, in the general case, we're looking at uh, tool chains uh, having identical versions, like ideally identical uh, bit for bit. Another question? After you've got the third party checks, there is also the matter of protecting the software distribution channels by ensuring your protocols guarantee that everyone is receiving the same packages rather than the system being compromised so as to give a different package to particular people. Right. So things like certificate transparency type things yeah. need to be applied to distribution channels to avoid a targeted attack so the people verifying the packages get the correct versions and one particular target for the attack gets a compromised package. Right. Yeah, and uh, but to a large extent, reproducible builds helps detect those scenarios. I, I mean, because if you have a hundred builders and ninety of them get a get a valid build, a, a matching build, and three or four of them get other random results, I mean, so in a sense, I mean, definitely you want to secure your distribution channels, but also reproducible builds adds another layer of of check against that kind of thing. If the attack is targeted, say, against one particular person's system, and of course that would not be the, any of the people who are verifying the builds from sources. Right. The attacker wants to attack one particular person, so they deliberately do not attack the people who are doing the verification. So sure. To avoid that sort of targeted attack, you need sure. the update mechanism to verify is have some method of verifying, yes, it's not possible to distribute a package unless there is this public commit, public commitment in multiple channels to precisely right. this binary package being distributed. Exactly. Yeah. I know people and have I'm, looked at that sort of thing, ways of say It's definitely being thought about. I know um, uh, the Intoto project kind of does that sort of thing, and then there's a, a build transparency logs kind of stuff that, that are people we've kind of talked to and worked with. So that kind of stuff is, is definitely necessary. I mean, with all security, it's always about raising the bar. <laughs> there's always a way in, um, and this, is, this solves some of the problems. Uh, so yeah, any more questions? Um, in your first slide, you suggested that um, reproducibility was about um, selected artifacts being the same. But now you seem to be saying it's bit for bit comparisons. Yes. Um, it seems to me that you could actually achieve much better results if you had a more restricted set. For example, the mm -hmm. compiled code was the same, even if the debug data's data was different because it had different paths in it, right. for example. So maybe what you should be trying to do is define a much uh, a way of specifying which bits must be the same rather than just bit for bit? Yes. <laughs> um, in a sense, it's actually more work. And in the long run, I mean, if the debug info is different, then how do you properly debug the thing? Well, it seems to be the same thing, but I've got a different debug file. Right, because you built it in a different environment. Your sources right. are in a different place. It's still the same right. sources and the same binaries. It's just the debug sure. information is different. Yeah, it, it's just a question of where you want to draw the line, really. I mean, um, and, and you get into trickinesses when you're like, oops, I guess we should have also verified that other file and, and, and we excluded it for some reason. So you get into that kind of a game where you're playing whack-a-mole. And so uh, at least with Debian, we're dealing with it on the package level. So the, the .deb file will be the exact same ha ha checksum. And uh, you know, similarly, you know, presumably for uh, Fedora, Red Hat, uh, Arch Linux, um, you know, uh, so we're targeting that. Obviously, you can do reproducible builds at whatever level you want to do them at. Um, so, uh, I mean, I've toyed around with ideas of doing it at the per file level of just like, how did, you know, where did we reproduce this exact file? Um, and maybe making a distribution around that kind of level of distribution. But uh, it's all, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of time and, and effort. 
Uh, and so right now we're looking at what are the, e the easiest way to verify something is you produce the thing that the user actually consumes and runs and uh, some way of getting a checksum on that. Anymore? Uh. You probably don't, aren't worrying about it now, but as machines start adding hardware uh, random number generators, it probably is going to add to your problems. Yeah, so one of the things which we haven't actually had the time to even verify, but like I did. Um, the, the ARM build zoo, I call it, uh, is just a diverse array of different boards. Uh, so I'm trying to check for hardware variation uh, uh, in that kind of a way. So yes, uh, as we get more and more sophisticated hardware variations, uh, but we haven't actually really had the resources to go through all of the logs and see if this particular board seems to consistently produce a different result or anything like that. Um, but yeah, with 30,000 source packages in Debian rebuilt on like, we're in reproducible builds, we're testing about four architectures. It's a, it's a, it's a limit of uh, human resources. <laughs> but, but yes, definitely we're going to be looking at some more complicated things like that uh, over time. Do you have any comment on both what the reproducibility and what counts as source code if part of the software distributed is, say, a trained machine learning model? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, trained models are kind of a complicated question because, in a sense, there really is no source code for that. They're not reproducible fundamentally, and we're seeing more and more software using those kinds of models. Uh, there are some things reproducible builds can't fix. Um, so yeah, when looking at trained model type uh, AI learned systems, uh, reproducible builds probably won't help too much with that unless you can start generating reproducible trained models, but that's going to be some magic. Working on the tool chain, we sometimes want to make changes which should not have any impact on the generated code, but we hope to improve user uh, experience by adding new warnings or turning existing warnings into hard errors. Mm -hmm. And a challenge with that is, in some cases, there are configure tests that alter the results of that change and the results are completely self-consistent in the sense that all tests automatically get disabled and you basically get a binary that passes all tests of the package but has a slightly different feature set. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is if we can use reproducible builds to inject different toolchain components on the uh, same version number mm -hmm. and uh, hope that the packages don't embed hashes of GCC binaries or something like that. And uh, this way we can actually rebuild uh, the distribution of a different tool chain and see if there are any differences. Yeah, uh, that, that brings up a really great point uh, that re one of kind of the side effects of reproducible builds is in like code refactoring. Like if you want to rewrite your code to be more human readable or add better warning messages or things like that, uh, then if the binaries you're producing only have the differences that you intended them to have, uh, and you can use a tool like Diffiscope or, you know, Object Dump or whatever to, to actually look at the results and see, oh, it actually only changed the stuff we're modifying. So that's, uh, that's a really, um, it's really useful for code refactoring or adding a new feature and seeing that only the new feature resulted. Because if you get other random things in your new binary or arbitrary other things in your binary every time you build it, it's harder to figure out uh, whether you only changed that one thing. So yeah. 
but you, you, you actually see that uh, if, if you make a non, uh, say you have a C program in, in, in Debian and there's a new GCC version that only changed the C++ front end mm -hmm. and uh, you rebuild um, the, 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 pa the packages with the old compiler version and the new compiler version, uh, it still converges in, in many cases or is sure. that, yeah? It, it varies a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty case by case example, so I don't know I can make any general statements, but. Okay, uh, then I'll have to look at that and yeah, see yeah. if it can, can be made to work, thanks. Uh, so first off, I, of course I agree with you that, that it just feels right to do reproducible builds. Uh, but uh, more and more in con a connected world, uh, uh, CVEs are coming in almost daily. Um, and it just seems that the tools we use to build our tools or distributions are being updated more frequently. It's like we need to update our libraries and components to build the main source compiler, uh, to rebuild that to, just to fix security holes and then rebuild the distributions. So if our baseline is changing, does the reproducible builds still help us in that world where we're always changing what we're using to even build everything? Well, I mean, it does in the sense that uh, you can make sure that uh, because, these tool, because the tool chains are changing so often, maybe that's a juicy target for somebody to inject a malicious tool chain. Um, so it can help detect against that kind of an environment. And you're really looking at, re we are looking at doing verifications rebuilt against the same tool chain. So if, if you want to verify the build, you have to use the old tool chain. And then maybe you rebuild it again with a new one, but you rebuild it two or three times and maybe have a third party do it. Like, you know, I mean, one of the examples is like, uh, ideally we get a rebuilder from like the NSA, the, the Civil Liberties Union and the Electronic Frontier Foundation or something like that. You know. Parties and maybe like, you know, the Russian military or something, you know, parties that are inherently arguably hostile towards one another or whatever. Um, but if they all converge on the same result, we have greater confidence that nothing weird is going on. So I think I think it does still help and maybe even more important the more often these tool chains are changing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what more to say on that. But yeah, thanks. Do your reproducible builds disable network access to avoid all the build systems that like to download things during the build, especially languages such as Go and Rust and so on that particularly like to automatically download dependent packages, which of course yeah. you really don't want to happen if you want to ensure it can be reproduced when those dependencies are no longer online. Those kinds of problems definitely need to be, you need to get the exact same inputs in order to get the same build results. So we, we consider those variable inputs or, yeah, so typically network access should be disabled if you're really looking for concrete reproducibility. And then like in the Debian model, you would package that dependency rather than download it automatically. Um, that's getting harder and harder to do with these very fast moving uh, fast moving networks of software development but but yeah you would you definitely don't want to get arbitrary input from the internet and expect a reproducible build <laughs> uh, I would just comment that there's actually some software that tries to download something from the internet and if it's not available, it falls back to something that's bundled. This way, reproducible build will show something reproducible, but actually on some internet connected systems, the result could be quite different. Sure. All right, last call. <laughs> All right. I think we'll call it. Thanks. <laughs>